Smokey Joe, back again. Change of scenery. We? How's the how's the sound? Okay. Absolutely amazing. And I'll tell you what, your internet this week is crystal clear. Well, I've moved into the makeshift office, which is my youngest son's bedroom. We're having an extension built, as you know, and we're decorating my youngest son's um, new bedroom as well as we can. So as you can see, his name's Monty, my youngest son. He's got Monty's jungle on that wall going all the way down there, which is a beautiful mural. And then we're in the corner. We've got Look a tree that. trunk. It's a tree trunk being made. It's going to be a tree in the corner. For him to Love play. that. So obviously, you know, my wife, Sally, she's um, obviously a midwife. But she's only doing it three days a week and she's done an interior design course. So a couple of people have asked her for like, interior design ideas and stuff and she loves doing decorating and interior design stuff. So that's why this is happening. The kids are outside in the paddling pool, which is right next to the fishing shed. <laughs> Not the paddling pool, the tent. I've just set the tent up. Set the tent I've just, up. I've just took the paddling pool down. So set the tent up. That'll keep the kids quiet in the tent. Um, that's right next to the fishing shed. And I think them screaming and shouting. Is and obviously the internet's course. quite nice in here, isn't it? It's internet's nice fantastic, it. apparently. You can see every single grey hair. Yeah, it's not too bad, though, is it? You are getting on a bit. Mm, I'm getting on a bit, you're right. You're so right. Okay. we've got... We've interesting... got to say it again. Yes. Yeah. Hey, oh, hey, oh, look, he's behind you. Who's behind me? George is behind you. What are you doing? What's the orange The orange battery pack? Yeah, because we need it for the tent. Hey, T, what? Try this one. This one will be better. Can you catch it? Don't climb that. All right, climb it then. Catch it. Come on then. Right. Smell your layer. So. Yet again, he just done like a moonwalk out the shop. <laughs> Did he? Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me. The so, things he does. Oh. <laughs> it's obviously unbelievably responsive in getting with these, as in the positivity. I know we say it every single time, but it really yeah. is great, and it? it's great to see. Well, let's us up. This morning, as we're filming this, we've released the last one with yeah. Simon, um, Simon yeah, Jones, and Adam Richards. And we've already got, after what, an hour? Mm. A load of, topics to, load of topics to cover, a load of questions, a load of people saying, cheers for this. And it's not just us, by the way. There's other people doing sort of this sort of thing. And I think it's just getting people through. It's just relieving a bit of the boredom, giving people their fishing fix. And, you know, it's just good. I enjoy it. I know you do. And I'm hoping people who are listening enjoy it. It passes the day nicely, doesn't it? One yeah. thing that someone has said, give a shout out to, after what Simon's doing, obviously raising money for the AHS, he says, have you seen the Captain Tom thing? Have you seen this? I've seen briefly on Facebook, that the old boy who's running. Is that garden. the old boy who's running? In laps of his garden, he aimed to raise £1,000 for the NHS, and he's currently on £5 million for the NHS, oh. which is incredible, isn't it? That's unreal. How, how old is he? Nine years, 99 years old, war veteran. And how many miles has he done? Does it say? Does it say? But it, He's done 100 lengths of his 25 metre garden. Well, let's not work that out. And he's, oh, he's reached more than 5,000 times his target. A lot. It's just brilliant, though, isn't it? People are doing. 20, 25 metres times 100. So he's done two and a half kilometres, which is probably more than I can run at the minute. <laughs> How much are you eating? I'm eating. I'm eating you know what? I've, I've had a breakthrough. I've had a breakthrough. Have you? Yeah, me and me and uh, Jay, who's living with us from New York, we've uh, decided we're on it. Fitness. Are you? We're, really? We're, we're in fitness mode. <sighs> I'm eating my body weight in chocolate every single day. <laughs> 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 and then feeling guilty about it later. It's great though, isn't it? Mm, yeah. You, can, you right. can do it though. You can do it. You can burn it off. Oh, we'll see. We'll see. Maybe not this time. Maybe this is a bridge too far for me. <laughs> <laughs> Too far. Right, let's get. Should we get some questions done? Because yeah, we have. We have got someone popping up later. Hopefully, mm. if uh, if he gets to, if he gets. Uh, his are answer. we are we gonna? What's gonna be the transition of him coming on? Is he gonna have the camera facing the right way? What do we I think? I hope so. I think I tested it yesterday. He had everything sorted. I think it'll be as smooth as anything. It'll be a little bit smoother than Adam Adam's um, farewell yesterday. Put it that well. Way. The rumor is that he's still sat there trying to turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> Every time he turns his phone on, he's still there. <laughs> he's still there in his garage. 
<laughs> so, right, come on, let's do a couple of quick questions. Then yeah, while you've Nigel got your computer on. up, you have a look at your questions, tell us what we've got. Right, back to the 90s, great name, says, carbon or glass tips when to use them? Now, this is a good one, this, because I used to love glass tips and you just don't get them anymore, do you? No, there's not many glass tips. And I think it's because... The blanks have got slimmer, isn't it? The blanks have got slimmer. So anyone that's got anything to do with um, rod manufacturer or rod design or anything like that will understand that unfortunately the trend is to have a pencil thin blank um at the butt end everyone's obsessed with marketing this pencil thin blank which means that you have to have a thinner quiver tip so the thinner carrier section for your quiver tip because obviously you can't have a rod that's totally parallel all the way up that's to have some taper on it that means that when you put a glass tip in it just doesn't act very nice so glass tips are brilliant when you've got that um for it's about 3.2, 3.5 millimetres. There's um, a distance quiver tip diameter now at the base. Mm. But a lot of rods with those pencil thin um, carrier sections, what are they, 2.2 yeah, millimetres? Yeah, our, our superior rods and monsters and Tysons across the board, it's 2.5. And I know that some other brands, it's like 2.2, which is yeah. really skinny, isn't it? Really skinny. And you just can't get a glass tip to work brilliantly. Well, it's hard to. It's hard to get a glass tip to work brilliantly in those really slim diameter quiver tip so like you i love a glass quiver tip but it's hard for them to get them to work really nice unless it's a thick quiver tip what what do you i think carbon's brilliant for casting because its recovery rate is fantastic um so if you're casting a long way i think carbon's really good but then um for shy bites you want a nice glass quiver tip i always think yeah i think i think glass tips are fantastic aren't they i always used to use them but i must say like the carbon tips we're using now they're, they're good anyway aren't they they are very yeah. good yeah and the loads better than they used to be they recover well like i don't miss and obviously I, it's funny i found some of my glass tips the other day from and like you say the 3.2 mil at the base and they look so chunky don't they now mm. like, yeah. and i actually filed some down to try and fit them in my rod and i just could not get them to work right um so i've scrapped that idea that's gone but they were great, weren't they? Because you could like bend them like that and they wouldn't break. Yeah, they wouldn't break. And I, I actually used to get the finest glass tip and then cut the end off. So the taper was still fast. I'd cut about just an inch off, just so that end bit, um, you could get the eye a little bit closer to the next eye. I'd, I'd take the eye off and put it close to the next eye. You just wouldn't get any tangles. Because I always thought the, the problems with the glass tips was if you had a, a gap of any more than that between the, the top two eyes, you get a few wrap rounds, and then when you tightened your reel to make your cast, that's when you used to break the tip. So I always used to just cut that down to that, cut that area down between the top eye and the next eye down. I just used to stop all of those totally. But I'd have to use the finest tip because obviously you're taking a bit off the tip to do it. it used to work brilliantly. That did. Yeah, but so to so to summarise then, really, like the rods these days, glass tips just aren't an option, are they? Sadly, no, no it's a shame. Sadly, so that's that one. Um, someone wants to know what would be your ground bait mix for Big River Bream and separately Big River Roach, and I think he means a big river, not not big fish. Well, it might be better both. Hopefully, you catch you some big, big roach. Fish. Maybe you can find a two pound roach that we're after. Oh, wouldn't it be beautiful to catch a two pound roach? Mm. Tremendous. I've been watching some videos as well, and the, you know when you watch the old videos on YouTube, and the amount of two pound roach that used to be around is amazing because they used to catch them for fun by the looks of it but i imagine there was loads of effort <laughs> gone into catching them john wilson videos where he's catching two pounders and yeah. massive rud he's catching massive rud out of gravel pits and passion frangling oh um, unreal so <laughs> ground bait mixes um, hey, he's back george is back is there what's he want there <laughs> where's the orange battery back because that one's run out of has it yeah come on dad i'll tell you where it'll be it'll be downstairs in the cupboard under the telly Keep yourself, hey. No, make sure you don't. Keep yourself to yourself. So, um, I think, you know, obviously we're coming into the river season, hopefully, when we get back out fishing again. So, we're talking warmer water. Now, if I was talking cold water, uh, every bait brand in the country is going to hate me. But if I was talking cold water, I'd liquidise some bread. Um, you probably would as well. And that would be my feed for big, rib, big river roach. Even if there's a little bit of colour in the water, really. Mm. Um, but as we're coming into it now, hopefully the fish are going to be wanting some real active stuff. feed and some, some proper stuff. So 
for me, I'd want a, a dark ground batter, and that goes against it. Isn't it strange that you use bread and it's brilliant and it's bright white? Yeah, I know. But then we use a dark ground bait when we're using normal ground bait. I'd use something like Friends Attempt Black and Brown Crumb if I was targeting Big Roach, and then some uh, Bream Original if I was targeting Bream. But I think I'd probably go down the fish mill route if I was targeting Bream. Yeah. It's a funny one, isn't it? Because it's something you taught me actually, but like when fish on like a tidal trend and you want something nice and active, don't you? Like, like the black roach that's on you do is a great mix because it comes out of the yeah. feeder quickly. Dark. Um, I think you want it dark, don't you? Dark, don't you? If, if you taste, put it on your tongue and it's a bit salty, I think that's a good thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, just there's loads of great mixes, isn't there, that you can try. Um, but if you want to go down a fish meal route, something, tell you what, on rivers can be really good uh, towards more the halibutty side of things. Yeah. Because they do seem to like a strong one, don't they? Every time you do that with your hand, you knock your thing and it goes click, click, click. Where is it? I'm sorry. Hmm. There you go. Yeah, but they definitely, I think uh, barbel anglers throw so many halibut pellets and high oil pellets in that mm. once the first couple of weeks of the season have gone by, those roach and bream have got a real taste for it again. Um, they don't forget what that bait's about and they, they love those sort of baits. So I think the biggest roach you catch now out of rivers are probably caught on pellets, I guess. Yeah. 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 Um, I had an interesting chat with Wayne Bartholomew, who's a ground bait guy and he likes his ground bait. Mm. And I said, what do you use on the tidal trend out of interest? And he's like, it's just ground up halibut pellets. That's all he does. Right. Is that all he uses? But he uses, yeah. So, right. Which I thought was yeah. interesting. Yeah, really interesting. Yeah, I suppose that's what they're seeing, aren't they? Yeah, that's, that's what, what they're seeing. seeing. That's what you've got to put in. Um, I had a similar sort of question about Ireland ground bait mixes, what we use in Ireland. And again, it's the same, similar sort of thing. And I think for a lot of your river, natural venue, it doesn't matter whether you go in Ireland or Big Lake, if you fish for those natural fish that don't really see fish meal, anything dark, anything that's quite, you, you'll, what you'll do is you'll smell it and it smells sweet, but then you'll taste it and it's, it tastes quite salty. Um, Cause the, 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 like you say, they do, the good ones do have a bit of salt content to them. Something dark, something active. Like I say, I use Friends Attempt Black and Brown Crumb, um, maybe a bit of Bream Original, but if you've got a good amount of brown crumb in there, I think that's I think that's um, yeah. a good start. To be fair, yeah, I think most companies, like you say, do really good silverfish ground baits now. Don't be frightened to use one that looks quite full of food, food rich, because I think river fish, wild fish, love a bit of that, don't they? They love a bit of food. Um, I think it's slightly different on venues like Evesham where it gets fished a lot. I think you need to refine your ground bait mixes and that a bit more. But I think for big rivers, like the chap suggests, I think you can't go wrong with a, a proper nice coarse ground bait mix to be honest there's plenty of food in no. there no no i think uh, as well you've got to be it, the texture is important so for all my feeder fishing i like to have quite a dry mix to start with but then be able to add some water to it as it's um as the session is going on so i have like my working tub where i can have my dry mix so it's, it's still quite dry you could probably hold it in your hand and maybe just squeeze a ball that I'm going to feed, and that's like my attraction mix. So I can chuck it in, get some activity in the peg, bits floating everywhere. And that might pull in some smaller fish, but it might pull in everything as well. But I just want to get some activity in your peg. And then as the day goes on, I can add a little bit of water to it from maybe a tub or an atomizer. I'll stodge it up a bit. And that's when you can fish a bit more of an inert ground bait, get it down. And then hopefully, you sit there, you tip like that, goes donk, donk, donk. <laughs> You've got a five pound bream on the end or a two pound roach. They're the dream, they're the dream days. Yeah, I think like just just summarise then a nice sort of sweety ground bait for your roach and stuff, and then and if it is a if it is solely bream you're targeting, you know give fish meal a try. Yeah, definitely, um, definitely, because they love it, don't they? Yeah. Right, on, next one. Um, this ch this Pedro, this is a chap called Pedro Gomez, and he's from Spain. Cool, what a cool name that is. You've eh? been there, haven't you? Yeah. Um, do you ever fish with sticky maggots in a cage feed of a carp like we do in Spain? Yes, well, it's funny you say that because a chap asked me the other day uh, of one of our videos about sticky mag and work it, whether it works in this country or not. Um, so the answer to the question from my chap is yes, it used to work fantastically when we used to do it in this country and I can't see any reason why it wouldn't work now. Uh, we used to use Horlicks to bind our maggots. Um, so tiny bit of water on your maggots. The, the key with sticky mag is to clean your maggots. So riddle your maggots get your maggots riddle them maybe even riddle them again put them in a bucket and the, the best way i've found to get really good clean maggots is to put my hand in a bucket of water 
run them through the maggots, and then take all the you that water will dampen the maggots, but also you'll come out with your hand covered with a load of dust and a bit of some you know bits of crap that's come off the maggots. Dry it off, repeat it. Hand in the water, hand through the maggots, take all the crap off your hands, go through. Nigel, was he here? Nigel was here. Hey, look at this special guest. All right, Nigel. It's working, mate. Yeah, we're on. That's it. We got it. We're on. We're running straight away. So, <laughs> Nigel, we've got Nigel Harrier. We told you we'd have a, we'd have a special guest today. Nigel Harrier, Mr. Barston, and we've got Nigel on to take that. away from the question we were talking about. Okay. We've got Nigel. 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 Sorry, Rob Carrier. Yeah, go on. We've got Nigel on to talk about what's happening at Barston uh, with a view to anglers still trying to sort of out the rules a little bit and get on the bank and go fishing and what Nigel's role has been because he's been quite active on Facebook recently um, and it's the time of year where things start to kick off really fishing wise and obviously there's a lot of fishers out there that need managing still with maybe feed going in maybe just daily patrols spawning times coming up so we'd like to know Nigel what your daily sort of routine is as far as looking after the fishery if you well, the, the fishery uh, is my hobby. The, the, that is, I treat it as a job and a hobby rolled into one. My job is the golf course. That's what I do for a living. And I've created the fishery because it's been my passion all my life. I grew up in a village called Wolston and we had the River Avon running through the village. So I fished from a kid. And uh, it's something that's become the same as all of us. Uh, we've uh, progressed into match fishing. We've, we've started somewhere, haven't we? So that's how it came about. We ended up buying this land with a uh, with a view to building the clubhouse and the golf course. Of course, it was a dream for me because there was a big lake on the land. So that's how it came about. Uh, 1999, actually, 20 years ago, we uh, we bought it. Um, the people. Uh, so so I don't do it as a daily job. I I am here full time, but it's not my job. The fishery isn't my job. It's my hobby. So I do go on the lake every day. No, just talk to people about, because obviously some people may be, there might be some people who have never been to Boston, talk okay. to them about the golf course and how nice the golf course is and the facilities and the clubhouse and what there is there, because it's not just a little golf course, it's a no, proper... It's proper. called West Midlands Golf Course, so it's a county golf club. It's the biggest clubhouse, in, certainly the biggest fishing clubhouse in the country, isn't it? Because it's actually a golf clubhouse. But we're passionate, my brother's a passionate golfer and I'm a passionate angler, so we run it as golf and fishing. So that's how we set it up. Uh, the clubhouse is overlooking the lake, so it's beautiful views. It's a 25 acre lake, and it's a mile round. So if you want to walk around, there's a public path around, public path around it, and it's a mile walk. So it's a 20 minute walk, it's a beautiful walk. Yeah, it's a good walk. If, um, are you still getting lots of people walking around it? Oh, well, well social distancing is, uh, and this exercise in, um, an hour's exercise in that we're allowed to do at the moment, it's gone mad. Because obviously people are off school, people are the kids off school, people are off work, so, and it's a nice, it's a nice, it's a nice week, week's weather. So people want to get out. So uh, yeah, really busy with walkers at the moment. It's hard, isn't it? Because you can't really blame them for wanting to get out. Of course not. No. But then all of a sudden you've got a lot of people in one place that I'm not too sure in the open air that it's too much of a problem. But it's when you've got people sitting on parks, going on parks, sitting next to each other, and. I, I, just I don't, don't know, know, Rob. I don't know. I mean, HS2 is less than a mile away from me, and they're still working. I've just been to Whitney Manor Golf Club this morning, and I've passed four building sites that are all working. So I don't know why they're all working, and we can't go fishing. It's a bit frustrating, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I think it's obviously just to cut down on the um, the strain to the NHS. Just obviously, if you just shut the country down to maybe 50, 60, 70 percent of its capacity, maybe, and yeah. um, we're probably at less than that. You just yeah. Obviously, lessening the strain, aren't you? A little bit on the NHS. The NHS can manage. I realise that. The NHS can manage. I realise that. Mm. As for the lake, I go around the lake every day. I pick up litter. I pick up dead fish. Uh, certainly, and now, as we're coming into spring, if we get any dead fish, it's always now. Uh, I expect to lose maybe tw 10 or 20 bream or ma maybe 10 or 20 calf as well this month as we get into uh, into this, this spring period. So, is it, why is that? Is it what, Rob? Is that stress? Is it the fact that the parasites are just getting to the parasites? The parasites are kicking the in. Paras yeah, the parasites are kicking in. The parasites get active before the fish do, really, before the fish's immune system gets active. The fish have been dormant all winter. Certainly, the carp have, haven't they? The skimmers feeding through the winter. Uh, but I've just seen a dead bream and two dead carp this morning, which I'm going to go back to the bin bag and pick them up. Right. So, have you had many people trying to fish? 
Yes, Joe, it's but summer's evenings, because I've got public footpath, summer's evenings, lads do come onto the lake and they do fish. They'll, well, they haven't paid, they possibly haven't got a rod license, they're not supposed to be fishing, they're often fishing on the surface as well, so they're breaking all the rules. Um, but providing they don't steal the fish, they're not actually costing them anything, are they? It's just annoying. It's yeah, just it's annoying the fishing. They haven't paid and they shouldn't be there. But I've got a public footpath right around the lake and I can't stop the public walking on the footpath. Yeah. yeah. Straight in. So, so obviously the odd guy's turning up with a, a rod, a telescopic rod and trying his luck, is it? More so than that. No, more than that. You know, we've had, we've had anglers with, uh, you know, all the tackle on the bank. They're not full match anglers like the kind of tackle that we would have. But, right. you know, they turn up with a box and, and their tackle. The trouble is, the far end of the lake, there's a public footpath. So they'll park there and walk down to the lake and then they'll, they'll fish, especially on a sunny evening. So it is annoying for me. And I had some yesterday and I put signs up now saying, during the lockdown period, if you see anybody fishing, stroke poaching, please call the police. And somebody did call the police yesterday and the police were down here and they chased them off. They ran away. Oh, uh, really? Choose me when they run away because it's easy. You don't get a confrontation. You don't, you don't have any face-to-face -face confrontation. Yeah. No. So you go on to the fishery, like the fish welfare side of things and that. Obviously, you, are you feeding your fish and supplementing them yeah, like that? I'm, I'm, I'm feeding them uh, one sack of eight mils a week. Uh, an eight mil pellet, I dropped one in a, in a uh, cup of water jug to see how long it would take to break down. I looked at the following day and it completely broke down into mush the following day. So um, I wasn't afraid of uh, feeding eight mils because what doesn't get eaten by the big fish will get eaten by the skimmers and the uh, smaller fish. Yeah. So just one sack of eight mils uh, a week at the moment. But the water temperature today is 16. So I'll, I'll go to two sacks now. I've got two sacks left, actually. So um, I'll use these two sacks this week, Joe, and then uh, I'll get some more stock. Have you and seen then... plenty of fish, Nige? Yeah, they're on the surface, Rob. I've actually seen some bream actually um, look like they're spawning on the surface. They're actually thrashing on the surface. Well, they're certainly not carp, because carp aren't going to spawn until they get to 18 or 20 degrees, like end of May or uh, early June. So I think they're bream. I think they're bream actually spawning together on the surface, which is unusual. Mm, amazing. What, so obviously you breed a lot of your own fish and you, you know, quite famous for you know, topping your own stocks up and stuff. When does all that process kick into gear then? Well, what I'll do, I'll, I'll keep an eye on the water temperature and it will like, say we're at 16 today. Another couple of weeks, uh, we're going to be near, near 18, I think. Um, I think at least four weeks. We need to be at least into the middle of May before they're going to be looking at spawning. I've never seen them spawn before the middle of May. Between the middle of May and, of course, 16th of June is our original start of the fishing season. So between the middle of May and the middle of June is the spawning period. I, I, 1st of June is, 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 is obviously banging in the middle of that. So middle of May, Joe, I, what I did last year, I dropped a net across the corner of the lake and they all spawned on my net. And it was easy for me to jump in the water and just lift the net up and just pick up. Uh, fat females. I did a I did a YouTube video last year on it. So it you actually do you take the fish out of the pond out of the lake then? Because I remember you saying you tried to keep them in ponds before, and I don't like that. And you kept them in keep nets before, and it's quite a, been a learning process for you, hasn't it? So uh, fishing's my hobby. Fishing's my passion. I've fished all my life, and I, uh, and I enjoy breeding fish. I've tried Christmas trees and conifers, and I've actually built a hatchery. When we had KHV in two thousand and six, that's when I, built, I bought some F ones for the first time. And that's when I built the hatchery then to be self-sufficient and breed my own fish that are immune to the virus. The same as we're talking about immunities now with the, with the COVID-19 built virus. Uh, the KHV was a big problem for us 15, what was it, 14 years ago. And I built the hatchery then, spent a lot of money on it, but maybe 10 grand on the hatchery. And I paid two, somebody £2,000 to teach me how to do it. So I put a lot of effort into, it, into learning yeah. how to do it. And those fish you breed are beautiful, aren't they? They're so nice. They're gorgeous because, uh, because I can pick up some uh, fully scaled mirrors and I can try and build, breed fully scaled mirrors, which everyone uh, uh, associates as being the prettiest fish, don't they? So, yeah. So your stock, your stock ponds at the minute, Nigel, are they totally dry at the minute? And then you're going to no, stop no, filling them up? Or? No, no, the opposite, Rob. They're still full of water. Uh, I've got four that uh, I think are successful and are looking good and really, really brown and feeding them well. I've got four that are um, really clear. I can see the bottom. So I don't think there's any fish in them four ponds. And them four ponds have got a lot of reeds on them and there's a lot of ducks on them. So I think next year I'll need to dig all the reeds out and deter the ducks from being on them ponds. Because uh, we don't blame ducks as being predators. We blame grebes and herons and cormorants and mink and otters uh, as being fish eaters. But ducks love little fish. Ducks will eat little fish like they're going out of fashion. So need to keep the ducks off. But I don't want to shoot ducks, obviously. <laughs> uh, I have netted them ponds off before 
and uh, I need to get them a bit deeper and get the reeds out and deter the ducks in them poor ponds, I think, in the future. Okay, so have you stocked anything in there so far this year into the big lake, or have I you... I have, actually. Yeah, I have, because um, Babylon Fish Farm, Jason at Babylon Fish Farm, put, I'm on Facebook this year, I, I'm new to Facebook, and he put an advert on Facebook there, he's got thousands of little F1s left over from last year, and he needs to get all his ponds empty for this year. So he put them on Facebook at half price, and I rang up straight away, and I said, I'll have five grand's worth. So I had seven and a half thousand fish off him for five grand. Bearing in mind, guys, this goes out to a wider audience. Are we allowed to stock left ones in Boston? Yeah, 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 sure. Um, yeah, we are. Um, their uh, their ones have been in there for years, and their ones are doing well. They're they're a crossbred carp, and they do well. Their ones okay. do really well. So, so there's, there's, there's no legal issue. There's no legal issue with F ones being in that sort of fishery, then. No, no. The uh, the F one, I think the F one fisheries uh, like tunnel barn a, a little bit out of favour now. I think the, the feeder waters are all in favour, aren't they? Feeder fishing yeah. has gone mad. Uh, and the F1's waters, the F1 fisheries are not quite so popular, I think. The, the feeder fishing waters are popular. But I think the F1's in a big water like mine do really well. They're amazing. They, they, feed, they feed, yeah, they feed in through the winter. They're feeding all year round. They're, they're, they're great bites, aren't they? You know, they pull your rod in. You can see by the size of them, because obviously a I know that you do get big F1s in sort of snake lakes, but you can see by the size of the fish in Boston, what's an average F1, four or five pound? Yeah, yeah. But they're not surviving, Rob. They're not surviving. That's why I bought 7,500 more. They're not right. surviving as well. They don't breed, you see. The, the carp do breed in the lake, but the carp won't survive. The fry won't survive with the carp. Right. Um, but the bream are surviving. But I, I do fertilise the water, so I've got lots of zooplankton and algae and... Daphne are in the water for, for, for the fry to survive. So just going back to them F1s, because funny enough, the day before we got put in lockdown, I was doing a feature at, at Barston, and I actually caught some little ghost F1s about this big. Beautiful. They're the new ones. They're yeah, the new ones. Fish. So is it seven and a half pounds of that size F1s you put uh, in? They were a mixture, Joe. The, 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 a a, a three-inch fish is, is generally a year-old fish, and a six-inch fish is a two-year-old fish. So I, I bought half and half. I bought half. And they've all gone in? They all went in, yeah. There was, I think there was two and a half thousand of the big ones and four thousand of the little ones. So yeah, them ghosties, they're beautiful. They're beautiful. I've not seen them yet, but... Uh, yeah, beautiful. I caught one. It was lovely fish. Lovely fish. Yeah, they're beautiful. They're yeah. beautiful. Awesome. So, what's... Uh, so, obviously now it's just a case of maintaining the banks, looking after the fishery, updating it all, keeping the fish fed. The last really. time I was there, you were ripping trees out, Nige. Yeah, I did, Rob. Yeah, yeah, I did rip the trees out. I, um, I can't keep up now because we've got 300 acres of grass here. We've got two golf courses and it's only me and Jake. We, we do have 10 green keepers and we have 54 staff in total and everyone's laid off. So it's just me and Jake that's mowing. So, so you've had to furlough the staff, have you? Yes, yes. We right. need the staff back as soon as we're open. And uh, yeah, everyone's been furloughed. And uh, just me and Jake are mowing. So no, I wish I could be spending time on the, on the pegs and making the lake look prettier, but I can't. I can't. Yeah. So obviously the golf course the golf course is more important, isn't it? Priority. I've got to keep yeah. it cut down. Got to keep it cut. Got to keep yeah. it mowed. Oh, shame. So, Nige, before you shoot off, tell us the next time, as soon as we get out fishing, or as soon as we're allowed to go out, where are you going to go and what you're going to do? I'll tell you what I would like to do. I would like to go and fish a waggler. I'd go just a bit of waggler fishing. I don't know, twenty yards out, twenty five yards out. Yeah, that's proper kind of proper waggler, not pellet wag. Proper. No, 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 not not sure, not pellet waggler. No, yeah, no, proper, proper, proper waggler fishing on the bottom. You know that's that's nice fishing. That's enjoyable yeah. fishing, isn't it? I've you know, I've noticed that when you uh, fish the odd match on your on your lake, you always want to catch get bites and be busy and yeah. You don't necessarily sit there on a big boilie waiting for a big carp to throw you in. It's no. a it's a busy match. You like to be busy. Absolutely, but uh, if you're in a match, you've got to fish the method or a hybrid nowadays, haven't you? And you've got to fish the pole or, or and the margins in the summer or up in the. You've got to fish to compete, haven't you? You're not going to put forty quid in the pot and not and, and mess around. But to, when you're pleasure fishing, you can go and do something different, can't you? I remember fishing a match once, Rob, on uh, Sligo Road in Enniskillen, and I, I always wanted to fish the slider, and it wasn't the right thing to do that day. The right thing to do was to fish the feeder, but I didn't care. I was there for a day slider fishing. It was one of the most enjoyable days fishing I've ever had. So I've never fished the slider, and I love that day. I had a yeah. great night fishing. Yeah, I suppose I think there'll be a lot of people just wanting to go fishing. Absolutely. Forget the match. They just want to go fishing when all this is done. And I think Absolutely. a lot of people have realised how... Um, important the enjoyment side of fishing is to them as well rather than just getting out there and fishing a match 
Uh, I, I did notice the other day, talking matches, that you sort of have got ideas put in place for when we do go fish some matches again, as far as distancing and depending on what sort of regulations there are in, in place, as in drawing in a different way, or how would you how would you envisage draws to be done? And well, the last match I ran, Rob, just before the lockdown, I uh, I drew the, I drew for everybody. As they arrived, they walked up to the table, they put twenty quid in the box, I took it out of their own wallet and put it in the box, which I didn't touch, and then I drew for them, wrote the number on the board, and they went straight to the peg. That that was it. So as they arrived, they drew and left. I could do that next time without having him get get out the car. I was, I was laughing with Mick Bull on the phone on Monday because I said to him, I said, we could draw, they could draw from in the car. And if they drew for 85, for example, they could drive straight to the peg. He said, no, if they drew 85, they could stay in bed. <laughs> it made me laugh. I don't know, 85. Talking about, sorry, we are talking about drawing the night before. That was yeah. what it was. I said, we draw the yeah. night before. If you draw 85, you can stay in your car. And he said, 85, you can stay in bed. And I did make me laugh. Yeah. But uh, I think if, you, if, if I did a draw like that, People who could arrive, draw, etc. So they wouldn't have to touch the um, uh, touch the draw pegs or, or the or the board or anything, but they have got a way in. So that's a difficult one. Isn't it? I can't weigh in eighty peg match. It's too many. I can't do it. Mm. It's not physically possible to weigh in that many. So I have a set of scales every ten pegs. So uh, last time I supplied some rubber gloves as well. I don't know. That's the only thing I haven't uh, quite perfected yet. Mm. It's really. gonna it's gonna be hard. That's for sure. I'm just wondering how long these sort of regulations or guidelines can be in place because obviously the economy is suffering massively and people are getting just want to get out and do things so i'm wondering if things like we're pleasure fishing first yeah i think so i think uh i'm not talk, i'm talking about uh, maybe industries um work wise and also pastimes that are more solid solitary I think they'll be allowed. They'll have to be because people are obviously going crazy stuck in the houses. The economy is suffering. Surely in two or three weeks' time, there'll be some sort of I think so. I announcement agree. where... We're, we're hoping we can go fishing and go golfing, but mm. we're expecting... I think they're going to keep uh, all stadiums shut this year, as in football stadiums and sporting events, and I, I do stock car racing at weekends. I can't see any sporting events this year where we've got a crowd. But I think we will be allowed to go fishing and golfing and do our normal sports. So maybe, had... maybe matches will be frowned upon a little bit as well. No, I, don't see why not. With, I, don't, I, I don't see why not. Okay. I see why not. Big Wayne did his as well. Big Wig, uh, Wayne Sherman, who runs matches at Netherlands. He, he ran his, ma his match the same as me. He, he did the draw for everybody. I think Darren Cox did the same. And uh, the lads that are running matches, they're doing the same. They're doing the draw. And nobody minds, do they, nowadays? No. It, and you could even, I suppose, you could even PayPal the money, couldn't you? Internet PayPal, so no one's even got to touch the money. It's possible, but me and my wife collected, uh, collected the money. Uh, sorry, we counted the money after the uh, after everyone had gone, and then count the money, put it all in envelopes. And we actually put the envelope in the clipboard, actually. So when they when they got the sec win section winner, they just gave him the envelope. There was, there was no payout back at the clubhouse. That's how we did it. Brilliant. So no one no one even had to go back to the clubhouse. No, no. First and second, uh, there's 150 quid for the winner of the section in an envelope in the clipboard, and 50 quid for second. And the walk, guys walked along the scales. And then you paid out, uh, you've won your second, as easy as that, and everybody went home. Uh, and then as soon as my wife's finished uh, counting the money, she washes her hands, you know, so we, we were yeah. safe. Super. Brilliant. Right, just um, give us your guess on a date that we can go fish again. Well, we're, uh, I'm hoping May the 1st. You know, that, okay. that's, uh, that, that's, um, that's where we'd like to be, isn't it? You know, if, hope you know so. I don't know. Who knows, Rob? Who Let's knows? hope so. Let's hope so. It's not far right. away, is it now? It's two weeks away. So, no, it isn't. You know, so it so. might be. How, how long can people cope? There's got to be a slow release, hasn't there? There's got to be a slow release. They've got yeah. to slowly let us back in. So, yeah. um, I, I can't believe that we're, we're in the situation, yet building shots are still working just as normal. I just can't get my breath. Yeah. You know, unnecessary work. No, and, I, too. and I, I, I know that obviously everyone's trying to follow the guidelines, maybe on building sites. But you know how it works. It's hard to work on a building site without being near each other or being yeah, it's impossible. close to someone. It's yeah. impossible. It's impossible. So I can't see why we're being held back. I don't know, Rob. Maybe two weeks, maybe no, four no, weeks, maybe six okay. weeks. But let's hope. Let's hope sooner. But sooner. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming on, Nige. That's awesome. You're welcome. Let's yeah, hope soon, we're seeing you in the flesh soon. So Cheers, time. Nige. Thank you, Rob. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Nigel. Bye. Oh, that was Nigel. Great for him to come on, wasn't it? Yeah, brilliant. Nice to see it's a different of... side of things. Let's just hope that we're 
can go back to Barcelona again sometime. Obviously, I know that obviously it's a bu- uh, business for Nigel, so he's missing out on quite a lot of business, the golf course side of it. Yeah. But I suppose everyone is, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, it's all, everyone's affected, aren't they? But let's hope that the uh, May the 1st thing, that sounds good. Yeah, well, I think of maybe a, a week after that. You reckon? For, for fishing, yeah. Fishing, golf, those sort of things. A bit more solid, solitary. I, I, in my head, I kind of feel like we might be able to go pleasure fishing, and then it might be a little while before matches and stuff can take that's, place. That's my feeling. That's my feeling too. Right. So before Nigel rudely interrupted us, I was cleaning my sticky mag, wasn't I? Cleaning. So sticky let, me mag, just, yeah. let me just cover the sticky mag. Clean the sticky mag with your hands. Damp hands that dampens the maggots slightly without overwetting them. It takes a load of crap off them as well. Then um, you add either sticky mag powder or Horlix. So a li- little bit of Horlix goes into the maggots, shake them up, bit of sticky mag powder goes into the maggots, shake them up and just leave them for a little bit. And what you'll get then is after about 10 minutes, your maggots will clump up into a ball. You'll be able to hold, you'll be able to squeeze them and they'll be staying to a ball and your hands will be pretty sticky and horrible. So it's nice to have a tub of water on your side tray as well just to clean your hands. Then... I like to do my maggots, so my sticky maggots, so they're rock hard. So when you chuck them into a little, you can roll them in your hand, you can squeeze them in your hand, you chuck them into some water and they take a good 30 seconds to start breaking down. I like that real hard nugget of maggots. Run them in a feeder, cage feeder, chuck them out, and I tell you what, it used to be absolutely fantastic on um, car, on car venues or you know venues that have got um, a mixed head of fish. So I imagine they still went out, but obviously method feeder and pellet feeder and at the time meat feeder was overtaking that sort of thing. Whether it worked now, I think it probably still would. But we, we do a lot of that sort of thing when we go abroad. Um, mm. The best feeders for it are usually feeders that have got some sort of bottom weight on them. So a rocket feeder is really good or something with a bottom ring. Just so you've, when you wedge your maggots into the feeder, you've got something to push against. So you can really ram the maggots into the feeder. Um, but yeah, where, did, where, did you, where did you use it over here then, Rob? White Acres was a place? To, I started doing it. Um, I started doing it. I actually read, and um, this is when I was going Holly Farm a lot, uh, before Method Feeder times, this was, um, before we got onto Method Feeders, this was a long time ago, late 90s sort of thing. Um, I knew that it was getting used at White Acres. I'd not even visited White Acres at this time. And me and my mate at the time I thought we'd try that Holly Farm. And we I think we were first and second on the first match we did it. And then on the next match, we actually drew. Uh, I think we had we had £72 something. I couldn't tell you the answers, but we had £72 something. We drew, and we were both fishing sticky mag feeders. Uh, and both obviously joined, joined first on the day. So the first two matches we fished them, it was, it was brilliant. Obviously, the fish had never seen it before. Um, yeah, but we were fishing, it. not like we do now with 50 centimetres hook lengths. We were fishing sort of like seven inch eight inch hook lengths three maggots on and little little maggot uh cage with sticky mags in brilliant yeah. fishing yeah i did a feature at the glebe league carry a few years ago and he fished it and it was absolutely unbelievable how good it was but then as mm. soon as the match came we both fished went back to type and fish pellets and corn and casters and stuff yeah, of so course it's funny isn't it yeah. well, well obviously everyone chucks a load of maggots in in the reds don't they for yeah. in the margins i, fish love them, uh, I can't imagine it's any different over on the far side it's good it's having the balls to do that sort of thing isn't it yeah, let me just pause it a sec, Rob. Right, we're recording again. Yeah. <laughs> What's to say? Leave it. Yeah, I said leave it. Yeah. Yeah. There's no one from. No one's going to watch that. That's in, that's uh, worried about his thing. No. Yeah. Comment. <laughs> 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 right, come on then. So, have you got any questions from your end? Yeah, let's uh, find one. You're not going to ask me about the big cut on my nose. Yeah, what were you doing? It's a wrestling-related injury. Wrestling with the boys? Seven, we've got a seven-year-old and a three-year-old that love wrestling. Mm. And what they do is they pin me down. Obviously, I let them pin me down because I'm not that weak yet. But um, they pin me down, and then they take it in turns to try and trump on my head. Jump on your head? Not, tr- not jump, trump. Oh, trump on your head. I was going to say jump on, on your head. head. So they pin me bit. down, then they shout to the other one, quick, trump on his head, trump on his head. Right. This is one for you, maybe, because you used to do a load of uh, snake lake sort of thing. Underarm casting. Obviously, you can't do a demo. Mm-hmm. Talk about underarm casting. What is the style? How, how have you got to do it? Well, first, you need a little rod, nice little short rod. Um, obviously, if you're fishing snake lakes, 
I know there is like seven foot and eight foot rods, but you definitely want nine foot and under really for a snake lake. Um, and the, the technique is kind of to make your feeder as you normally would and have it in your left hand, rods in your right hand as normal. Uh, pull it, get, give yourself a little bit of tension and sort of in one smooth motion, use the tension in the rod like a normal cast and just sort of underarm it out. And one, It takes a bit of practice because to start with, when you do it, it'll probably veer off to the right or left, whichever way you're doing it. Um, so you need to try and do it more underarm if you can, but that's the technique. Sort of give yourself a little bit of tension and just sort of fling it out nice and smoothly. And once you get into it, it's really nice, isn't it, Rob? The old underarm cast. And you can be amazingly accurate because it's a different trajectory. See that word? Good word. Tra trajectory. Beautiful yeah. word. Yeah, I always find sometimes standing up um, helps standing up, a little bit. Yeah. Because yeah. you can get a bit more, you can get more, a bit more of a swing. And yeah. it's, it's hard to... It's hard to get the accuracy to start with because sometimes you want to do it as a bit of a side swipe rather than a straight underneath. Yeah. Obviously, the, the closer you can get the feeder running vertically, it is straighter. Straighter, you're going to get it straighter. But obviously, sometimes you have to do it as a bit of a side swipe from the from the side. But it's a brilliant way of casting on like snake lakes. You know, when it, especially when it's windy and you want to chuck a little method feeder out, or not everyone's got a 16 meter pole up there and they want to chuck, they want to chuck a little feeder across, no. or they one want thing, to get the pole off the water. One thing I used to do because on really windy days at the Oaks, for example, we used to do it a little bit. And uh, the best way I found is actually to fish because you never have every peg in, or rarely, you actually fish it into the next peg, which meant that you were chucking sort of 18 meters rather than 13 meters or even 20 meters. And it just meant you could fish almost normally into the next peg and, and that can okay. be a good way to do it and obviously that's water that no one would have even reached with a pole isn't it no exactly so it's just um because it, it can be quite tricky can't it to be super accurate under arm it takes a lot of practice yeah. but um if you have got a bit of space don't be frightened to chuck down into the space is what i'd say yeah i'll tell you what i'm looking forward to it's a different thing but it's still under our method feeder fishing but a, a day red, a red hot day I'm thinking maybe Larford is the ideal place. Mm. Just dropping a method in at like six meters, seven meters out and just wait for the, just the love it, don't to you? disappear into the lake. I love, I'm, I, I'm, I love those toe round bites. I'm just obviously addicted to those toe round bites <laughs> and the, the faster and more aggressive those bites are, which obviously a 20 pound carp, like the fish at Larford, double figure fish, um, when they pick your bait up, it's unreal. You can get your bites at six or seven meters. Yeah. Here's one for you, just looking through my thing. We're talking about pole rigs. We've had them last week, uh, a couple of days ago. For, um, extreme sort of like fishing, catching a lot of fish. Do you ever fish straight through or do you fish hook lengths? Uh, yeah, if I fish, all my pace rigs are straight through. Um, I use them on 018 straight through. Um, but that's it, really. I used to fish 010 straight through at the Oaks all the time. Um, Silstar at the time. I used to use Silstar. Uh, 010 Silstar straight through. But other than my pace rigs, no. I don't. Do you? I, yeah, I do for my margin rigs. Some of my margin rigs. If I want something that's super aggressive in the edge, mm. and what I'll do is I'll probably set up two or three rigs, um, just as as duplicates. Because obviously the trouble is when you if you do happen to snap a rig or break a float or whatever happens to a rig, you can't just put a spare hook length on and, and start fishing again. So you need to have a couple of duplicates set up. And also margin fishing, you usually fishing right at the end of a match you might have such a small amount of time and you don't want to be wasting three or four minutes putting a new rig on plumbing it up and doing all that so i'll have probably a couple of spare duplicates out the way i used to look at it as you i used to fish straight through all the time and i always used to think my presentation was better when i fished straight through rather than having hook lengths um hook length knots and loops in in the way um and I never used to be bothered about putting shot on the line either when I was fishing straight through. I can't remember many times I had any problems, uh, no. if I'm honest, about fish with fishing straight through. No. I, I do think your presentation is superior, especially mm. when you're fishing, like because that loop to loop, no matter how neat and small you make it, is a, awkward, isn't it, on your line? But yeah, obviously is. nowadays you need to be able to, you know, if you have a band break or your hook, let, hook goes blunt or anything can happen, can't it, in a match? Yeah. You, Sometimes it's, it can be a pain tying your hook on or whatever, can't it? So, and obviously we're hair rigging a lot, which makes fishing straight through quite difficult, doesn't it? So, yeah. um, more and more, 
just for plants. But like I said, I wouldn't pay string when I've got a thick line on and a big hook. I do like to fish straight through. Mm. Yeah, yeah, me too as well. I think me you too. You know, like you're itching to do your five meter method of feeder fishing. You're itching to go pasting, Boring. aren't you? Boy, I just can't wait to roll in a big piece of paste like that and catch some great big munters. Right. Which venue would you choose? I'll be, I'll be going to Shearsby Valley. As soon as this lifts, I'll be at Shearsby Valley. Right. Big pot of hemp, pot of paste. I can't wait. Honestly, I'm so <laughs> excited. Because I felt like last year we had a session, didn't we? And we had... Yeah, you, were, you got it sorted, you. I yeah, think I, I felt like I got some, a few things that I really liked and I just can't wait to get yeah. out and do it. Load of hemp. Load of hemp, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a load of hands. Brilliant. 15 mm -hmm. all I can't wait. Honestly, I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> right, have you got anything else you want to cover? Um, let's have a look. Let's just have a look. Have you got anything? Because there's a couple there that we can... I didn't make any notes of it because obviously I thought um, with the office move... I'll tell you what we like need to do. The paddling pool and... Show the... people how to tie a lasso. Oh, well, I'll tell you what. You could show me how to tie a lasso because I, I, I haven't got a clue. Yeah. I used to tie, I think I used to tie, I did I used to do a grin or not? That's why I do yeah. a grin or not, yeah. I, yeah. A few people have shown me some like proper like lassies, but I've always found a grin or not to work quite nicely mm. for me. You'll have to show me how to tie a grin or not. How do you do a grin or not? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. I think I used to just tie a loop and hope and try and wedge the pellet in somehow. Yeah. That's why I ended up using bands, and I guess that's why a lot of people use bands. Someone said here, his son got laid off work because he's an apprentice carpenter, but he got off his bum. He didn't say bum, but got a job at a hospital cleaning. That's good, isn't it? Good lad. Um, I've noticed, um, I've seen a couple of adverts on Facebook. Maybe they're scams. It's in uh, hospitals, one in obviously the staff and tradesmen, carpenters, electricians are setting up wards and obviously apply get in because we're desperate for the desperate for some trades to set up all the uh, all the equipment and the wards yeah well preston innovations angler zach brown he actually fits ventilators for a living so as you can imagine he is really busy now. Out. Yeah, right. Out. right last one because you mentioned it is about the depth of water um what depth of water in each time of the year as a general rule do you think thermals make a difference hmm. i'm not too sure we understand thermals and thermoclines and that sort of thing like we should no i think there's a bit of um misinterpretation of those sort of things so i i spent quite a bit of time at brooksby college doing my fisher management course and we were talking about thermoclines quite a lot and my understanding was that an actual thermocline which is the it's almost like a visual um, you can almost see it where the water changes density because of this thermocline in the water and it goes from hot to cold and different uh, density levels you can see if you went and dart, uh, dive down you could actually you can actually visually see this thermocline i was under the impression that only happens in really deep water so a lot of the commercials we fish are probably six foot and less i'm not too sure whether an actual thermocline that people want to term it as mm. is happening but different layers in the water are definitely, definitely places where fish want to yeah. sit. Especially in the summer, because obviously you've got to take into account like oxygen content and all that sort of thing. And everything makes a difference. So what a good angler would do is everything in his head, everything, all these little things, oxygen level, air temperature, air pressure, wind, water uh, rip, ripple on the water, water colour, they'll all go into a really good angler's head and an angler will then make a decision of where the fish are going to be. So even if it's a bright, hot day, but it's really windy, that wind's going to push the fish down a little bit. Even though the fish want to come up in the water because it's a really bright, sunny day, that wind will just push them down a little bit. If the air pressure is really high, but it's still not that warm, the fish will still come up high because the air pressure is high. It's where they feel comfortable. Now, what you've got to decide is whether they want to feed in that depth of water or whether they're just sitting there because that's where they feel comfortable or not. Mm. Um, and they're the important factors that you've got to take into account. Generally, though, carp fishing, F1 fishing, the warmer it is, the shallower the fish are going to come. Yeah. Um, and I always see that when there's a little bit of ripple on the water in the summertime, fish just drop down maybe like three or four inches. Foot, you know, when you're fishing shallow and you catch them a foot deep, F1s, you get a ripple on, 
you can catch them at maybe a foot and a half deep, two foot deep, but they'll probably sit there and be a bit more comfortable because there's a ripple on the water. That's mm. what I've always found. It's, it's interesting. You talk about the firmaclines thing, going back to that. I once went swimming in the, it was called the Crystal River in Florida. And uh, it was one of these where you swim manatees. Obviously, they're like a big sea animal, but they're in this river. They go up there for breeding or whatever. And we were swimming around for ages in this river and it was so nice and warm and beautiful. And then there was this one spot and the lady said, dive down there and you, you'd be surprised. Like, cause it's like a no, notorious spot where this firmicline is. And it was like going from a hot bath and jumping into like a, one of those ice pools. It was unbelievable. And this whole area was just, it was barren. There was nothing there. And yet in the top bit where it was warm, it was stacked with fish and these manatees oh, yeah. and wildlife and that. And yet in on the cold bit, there was no weed growing. It was, was just it, like- Was light. it deep? Was it deep? It took a bit of a dive down. It was probably like 15 foot, something like that. Yeah, well, that's, that's the depth that we were told, sort of like 12 to 15 foot. That's probably the shallowest that you can get yeah. um, thermoclines within reason. Yeah, because I'm not a great swimmer, but I could get down there. So it must have been 12 to 15 yeah. foot. But yeah, it was, other, it was amazing to see it in nature like that. It was just freezing cold. The other thing I am, um, when we have got a lot of netting, and anyone that's been netting fish will probably realise this as well. We'd go out to all different, all, all different fisheries and the more natural style fisheries that we'd go to you'd always notice areas just little hot spots so you go you get your uh, dry suit on and you go out netting and you could find an area i don't know whether it was a spring or an area of silt or whatever it was but you'd go and there'd be an area maybe the size of a car that was warm it was warm water because obviously we're doing a lot of netting in the winter time so everything was freezing we'd break the ice sometimes to go netting and um You'd find an area, and it's warm. You'd say, you'd think, "This is this is beautiful." As if someone, as if you go swimming, like in the swimming pool and a pee in the water when you're a kid. <laughs> <laughs> it was like that warm, so noticeable. And then you'd move a couple of meters to the right or to the left, and it was freezing cold again. Mm. And there was just obviously hot spots um, on these little lakes. Yeah. Imagine if you knew exactly where those were. You know, so yeah, so yeah, noticeable. Yeah. yeah, you would be. You'd be laughing. Yeah, but at the minute you can obviously see it so much because fisheries are posting like Nigel and that are posting these videos and pictures of their lakes at the minute. Obviously the sun's out, the fish are under no pressure and no. every fish in the lake just sat there on the top, innit? Yeah, with its mouth out waiting for some food. Yeah, I saw a video at Tunnel Bound Farm yesterday and obviously you look at these pictures, don't you? You think, oh, look at that, solid. But it really, it's like a few fish. Mm. Tunnel Bound was solid. Was it? <laughs> Unbelievable. You can see fish on top of fish, literally. What, climbing on top of each other for the food? Yes, no, 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 they're not feeding. They're just chilling in the sun. But there's obviously, there's all the carp on the top. But if you look, there's just fish. Just solid fish. Right. Ridiculous. So they're just yeah. living it out there. They're probably just chilling. Yeah, nice little break for them. Nice little break. But like, who do you think would be a good guest next time? Because there's quite a few people who we could get on here, isn't there? Yeah. Well, I think I'm going to know where with Phil Briscoe. So if Phil will I come think, on yeah, and have a chat about Phil Golden be... Reel. Yeah, because obviously he's very topical at the minute and at the time when he can like book his matches in again and mm. it must be a tricky spot for them guys yeah yeah it would be yeah yeah and i think you know getting people on share their opinion i think it's i think it's good yeah i think brilliant. it's good what's your plans for this afternoon lovely day out there what's your plans well i'm at work today so i've got some videos to edit and um, obviously right. doing lots of stuff for the preston channel at the minute like this via this zoom mm. um so i've got one of them with lee to do this afternoon and then uh, yeah and then i might go out and uh, Enjoy the sun later. You've not been kicking the football about? Not today. I'll no. be later. Later on. I've got a, a, a quick video to edit um, for someone, a little product video to edit for someone. And then we've got the tent up, so we might end up having a camping party outside in the garden. And then I think we'll have our hours walk with the dog. Well, maximum like, amount of No there. fishing prep. No fishing prep. I'm, not trying, not, I'm trying not to do any. Have you tied some hooks? I have. Okay. Well, this oh. hook box has been there all this time, and I thought, do you know what? I'm going to start tying some hooks. So, look, I didn't go very far because I ran out of bands, but I've got three prongs filled. Look, mm -hmm. looks impressive. Yeah. I think you've been quite presumptuous marking them all up. Why? Right. What you're going to tie? Yeah, no, no, because that's like a nice setup, isn't it? No, let me have a look. Take that anywhere, can't you? No, ten to the twenty. These are all eyed hooks on this side, by the way. So they're, what are they going to be? KKMs? No, no, they're GPMs, which is GPMs. The GPMs. What's, how, what's the distance between that? Um, so what I've done. The short distance, the feeder distance. No, there? no, so what I've, I've done, 
Um, these are just going to be from pole fishing. So I've got three inches, which I like for my F1 fishing. Yeah. And then I've got five inches, which is a bit more like general. All right. So that's it, yeah. All right. So yeah, nice. Yeah, very good. Impressed. Yeah, well, it'll probably still be like that in a few weeks' time. <laughs> well, we'll see you next time, won't we? Because would you believe it, even though I work for a tackle company, I've just had to buy 10 packets of Preston bait bands. No oh dear. So I'm waiting for them to turn up. Right. So, okay, yeah. enjoy uh, your editing. Yeah. And next time, what do you reckon, two, day, two days' time? Yeah, we'll next try Next time, yeah, hopefully days. we've got a guest for everybody. Yeah, Phil Briscoe would be nice to get on. So we'll also get an angler on. We'll try and get an angler on as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll get him on soon. Oh, Phil is an angler. Yeah, I know. I know. Phil's more known for his fishery, isn't it? Okay. Cheers, Rob. Toodaloo.